Welcome to Bethlehem United Methodist Church in our 1045 service. If you're visiting with us, we especially want to thank you for joining us. Hope that you feel at home and, and welcome and experience God's presence as we worship together. Also want to welcome those of you who have joined us online. There are those who are very faithful and watching week after week, and you are an important part of our congregation, and, and we, we love you and are thinking about you. If you um, have joys or concerns, jot those down in the comment section, and we'll lift those up a little bit later in the service. We'll be singing songs together. We'll be praying together. We'll hear God's word read and proclaimed. We'll receive an offering. So technically what we will be doing is called liturgy, liturgy. Liturgy itself is made up of two Greek words, laos, which means people, and uh, algia, which, which means work. So liturgy is the work of the people, and so is worship. So what that means is worship isn't just something you do in a pew watching other people do, but worship involves all of us, all of us, opening up our hearts to receive what God has for us. Here's how it works. When you sing with all your heart, you will inspire someone else to sing. When you lean in and listen to the scripture as it's read or proclaimed, you'll inspire someone else to be engaged when scripture is read or proclaimed. When you lift up a prayer concern for someone who you love, who's heavy on your heart, you will encourage someone else to lift up an important prayer concern. And that's, that's awesome. R worship really isn't about something that we watch someone else do. Worship is the work of the people, and we're all God's people, and it's time to worship. We invite you all to please stand with us. Who breaks the power? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless? In awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Makes an orphan, a son and daughter, the King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You laid down your life And I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I 
sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Sing. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. Then you would take my place. Then you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. It's joys and concerns time. We have a SPRC meeting following the service. We're are making progress and hiring some people. We have a, a maintenance person we think, we hope, is going to work out. We uh, have Daniel on board and, and Cade on board and have some interviews later this week. So please keep, keep those search committees in your prayers. Where, where else have you seen God at work or what prayer requests would you like to lift up? Pat has the microphone so that everyone can, can hear you. Any celebrations? There we go, Jeannie. We had a wonderful visit and safe, made it safely there and back to visit my grandson, our grandson. And that was a blessing. And thank you for any prayers that were sent for our safety. You know it. Um, I also wanted to lift up my first cousin um, has come down with some kind of autoimmune disease. And it seems pretty serious, but she's going up to, to Mayo Clinic in sep mid-September to try to find a diagnosis. But it sounds a whole lot like something that our friend has, and he's suffering. Mm. And he was a good friend of ours, and he has an autoimmune disease, and um, they still don't know how to treat it. So from Vanderbilt, but they both need our prayers. Okay. This Pray autoimmune stiff is Jeannie's cousin and, and, and friend. friend. We'll continue to pray for, for him and, and pray for her. Um, I want to thank everyone for their prayers for my niece who had open heart surgery this week. It went really well and she just texted and she's been discharged, so. Mm. Thank you very much. Yeah. Glad you could be with her and there in Indiana. Um, down here, I think, over here. My daughter Lindsay has been in Canada the last few weeks and was supposed to come home Friday, but they had to evacuate the house that they were in and the the devastation up there, I mean, obviously Hawaii's bad too, but anyway, it's been pretty scary up there and lots of family members were affected, not my family, but the people that she's with were affected and we just need to keep them in our prayers. Has she been able to get back no. yet? Or is she still there then? Okay, pray for Lynn's. Yeah, will do, Teresa. Trey celebrated her birthday yesterday. Who's that? Trey. Happy birthday, Trey. <laughs> There's another birthday up on the stage, too, Friday, Connor. Connor, happy birthday. 
our bass player and singer. Who else had a birthday this year? <laughs> yeah. okay. All right, anybody else? Want to pray for everybody going back to school and who are already back at school. So, all right, let's spend a moment of quiet reflection and we'll approach God in prayer. God of life, creator of the earth and all that is in it, you have blessed us so abundantly and we are grateful. And yet we confess that we are so easily seduced by accumulation. Our iPhone 7 or 7B or 12 seems so hopelessly out of date when the newest model hits the market, whatever number that is. And we feel inadequate without it. And yet when we get it, we feel kind of empty, like something is missing. And it is. Because what we really need, Lord, is you. You are our heart's desire. We were created to worship you, and our souls long to worship you. Fill us with what we need, with what we need most. Fill us with your spirit. Make us new, make us truly, truly yours. We can't do it on our own, but with you, we know nothing is impossible. Thank you for your presence with us. Thank you for prayer. Thank you for music. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this congregation. Thank you for your people. For our brothers and sisters here with us now in this place. And for those who are no longer with us, but have made our being here possible and who still inspire us who are still cheering us on help us to encourage one another and to be a blessing to our community and to our world we lift up the celebrations and joys and concerns that have been shared and those that we bring before you now in the silence of our hearts God of life, creator of the earth, and all that is in it, we pray in the name of your Son, who has taught us and is teaching us to pray as his disciples sang. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In his second letter to the church at Corinth, the Apostle Paul has said in chapter 9, verse 7, each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not regretfully 
or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. It's time to receive this morning's offering. And if you are visiting with us, we'd ask if you would to fill out the registration form provided in the back of the pew so that we'd have a, a record of your visit with us. My wife is smiling at me. It makes me think maybe I've just done something wrong. I don't know. She's just, she's just glad to be in church. Okay. Whew. You know, you just never know. Okay, let's pray together. Loving God, free us from greed and fill us with generosity. Release us from our insecurities, like thinking that our wife's looking at us for some reason or another that we might enjoy and be content with what you provide for us. Strip us of our fear and strengthen us to love one another as you have loved us. Amen. Oh, 
blood rains forever all my days hallelujah hallelujah God reigns hallelujah God reigns oh hallelujah God reigns forever all my days God, I look to you, you're where my help comes from, give me wisdom, you know just what to do. Amen. Stephanie at the front for children's time. Maybe a little bit of show and tell. can see everybody's beautiful faces. Good morning. I'm so glad that you're here today. Do you notice anything different about what I'm wearing today? I notice you're wearing a backpack like my mom does. I have a backpack like her mom. Yes, I am wearing my backpack. Do you want to know why I'm wearing my backpack? It is back to school. That's right. And you know what? And you're carrying things in it. And I'm carrying things in it. But you know what? Most of all, I love back to school. I love it. In fact, I do. I do. I know it's weird. But Pastor Craig gave me this backpack. You know, Pastor Craig's my husband. And he's really good at sharing. I, I know. I wave at him all the time like that. Um, but... He's really good at sharing, and he's really good at giving things to others. So he also knows that I can't stop going back to school. I mean, I'm like old and everything, but I keep going back to school. I love it. So um, today, he, Pastor Craig's going to talk to us about um, a parable of the rich man. Do you know what parables are? No? Well, let me tell you. Parables are special stories that Jesus told, and he told them to his disciples, and they're in the Bible so that we can all learn important things about how to live our lives. That's what we get from parables. And this parable about the rich man is about this man, and he planted some grain in his field, and he got way more grain than he thought he was going to, like extra, extra grain. So he had to think about what he was going to do with all of it. Do you know what he did with all the extra grain? Traded in for money. What else could he have done? What? Given it to people who needed it? He could have given it to people who needed to buy food. Yeah, people that needed to buy food, he could have given it to them. But do you know what he did? He, he just built some more barns to put it in. He just kept building big barns and kept putting the grain in there. Every year that he got an extra crop, he just put it in the barn, built another barn and put it in the barns. That's kind of different, isn't it? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's not exactly what you would think he would do. Well, have you guys grown any grain lately? I'm not a farmer. Oh, she's not a farmer. Okay. Well, so, and neither neither are parents. But but we have we we haven't grown grain, but we have been given some school supplies, right? Because you guys started school a couple weeks ago. I'm going to tell you, that's a great question. She wanted to know, what does it have to do with each other? Well, what are some school supplies that you were, that your parents or someone bought for you? Earplugs. Earplugs. Headphones. Headphones. What did you get for school? Um, I don't know. Don't know? Yes. <gasps> what did you get for school? What did you get for school? Backpack. A new backpack. A but, binder. But a binder. It, but it hasn't been coming, and the people who we ordered it from, they keep saying it's a little bit late. Oh, it's going to be yeah. Next week. Well, what about? When, when, and, and it's, and it's mm -hmm. never there that week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That happens. So, what if? What about colored pencils? Does anybody use colored pencils anymore at school? Yeah. Well, would you get like one box, two boxes of colored pencils at the beginning of the year? Maybe one. What if somebody gave you like 20 boxes of colored pencils at the beginning of the school year? Uh, I'd give them to people who didn't have any or like forgot theirs. Okay. I don't know. I would give them to people because some people really want to learn. Mm -hmm. And... Mm -hmm. Right, their parents don't have money. Yeah. Do you think giving the pencils away would be something that Jesus would want us to do? Yes. Yeah, because that's the way he lived his life, didn't he? He shared and he gave and he helped people all the time, didn't he? Yeah. So I think in this parable of the rich man, that's, there's some things we could think about about that when we have extra. What would we do? Now, I'm not telling you to give all your school supplies away because you need them to do the work. But, but I know some things that you have a whole lot of. I know some things you have a whole lot of that you could give away. What do you think you have a whole lot of that you could give away? Stuffed animals. She has stuffed animals. I've already been doing a stuffed animal donation, but I'm guessing um, you're... You were kind of pointing somewhere near my heart, so that gave me a clue that it could be love. It could be love. That's right. And I have a couple of other ideas. I think you have a lot of smiles. I think you have a lot of kindness. And I think you have a lot of ability to be a good friend. And those are things that you can share and give away every day, aren't they? That's right. So let's do this. Let's do this. Since we've been thinking about what we could do when we have extra, let's share a smile with each other right now. You ready? Let me see a big one. Okay. Now, because we're giving away something really good, let's turn around and share a big smile with everybody out there. Ready? Go. All right. Good job. Good job. I think, I think they all feel better now. Let's pray. You ready? Bow your head, please. Dear God, help me to not keep all the smiles and all the kindness and all the friendship to myself. Help me to remember to love my neighbor as Jesus taught me. In his name we pray. Amen. The uh, children are now dismissed for Children's Church, and we invite the rest of you to please stand for our song of preparation.
Yes, Lord, by day or by night, waking or sleeping, Thy presence, my life. Be Thou my I ever with Thee, and Thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, and I Thou true Son. Thou in me dwelling, and I with Thee one. I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and Thou only my first in my heart. I keep of heaven my treasure thou Lord you are more precious than silver scripture lesson this morning is from Luke chapter 12 verses 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to them, friend who set me to be a judge or arbitrator for you. And he said to them, take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed for one's life does not consist in the abundance of prof- possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. Then he thought to himself, what should I do for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, I will do this. I will put down my barns and build larger ones and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, This very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, 
but are not rich toward God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you both. Thank you, Daniel, everybody. Lord, what we don't know, teach us. What we don't have, give us. What we are not, make us. Through Christ our Lord, amen. As I dove into our text for this message this week, I thought of a song from the 1960s, from the early 1960s, What's It All About, Alfie? Recorded by Diane Warwick, Cher, Barbara Streisand, Celia Black, and others. And I found out, didn't know this before, but I found out that the name Alfie actually means wise counselor. So the questions in this song are being asked of someone who is wise. Let's take a look at, at some, of the, some of the words. What's it all about, Alfie? Is it just for the moment we live? What's it all about when we sort it out, Alfie? Are we meant to take more than we give? Or are we meant to be kind? And if only fools are kind, Alfie, then I guess it's wise to be cruel. And if life belongs only to the strong, Alfie, what will you lend on an old golden rule? Good questions, right? What's, what's it all about, Alfie, wise one? Is it good to be kind, or is it wise to be cruel? What's it all about? Well, you might have noticed in our parable that Bo read for us that this farmer is described in a certain way, and in one word, by one word, in particular. We're pretty familiar with the story, right? There's this farmer who's already rich. First, first verse says this farmer who is rich has a crop that produces an abundance, far more than he expected far more than his barns and storage facilities could hold. And so he's got a decision to make, right? He's got to figure out what he's going to do with all of this extra food. Well, notice, remember, this is the Holy Bible, right? Notice first what he doesn't do, because that's pretty important. Notice that he doesn't pray. He doesn't pray. He doesn't call up Alfie on the phone or shoot him an email. He, he doesn't reach out to gain wise counsel. He just decides what he's going to do all on his own. Verses 17 through 19 describes it for us, right? He sees this abundant crop, so abundant that he's astonished by it, and he says, hey, this is all right. What am I going to do with all this food? I don't, even, I don't even have barns that could begin to store it all. Don't have enough storage space. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear these little puny barns down that I have, and I'm going to build me some big barns. And after I cram that grain full in these barns, after that, 
I'm going to get out on my porch, get in my rocking chair, drink some lemonade, and listen to the Grand Ole Opry. And I'm going to say to my soul, soul, you are all right. You have done well. Take it easy. You've got it made. Now, I would venture to say that up to that point in the story, most of us would say that this man's life is unfolding in many ways, much like we would like for our lives to unfold. Let me put it like this. Personally, I would rather win the lottery than not win the lottery, you know? Call me a capitalist, you know? I mean, it's just kind of the way that I was raised. I would rather win the lottery than not win the lottery. I would rather my crops produce such an abundance I wouldn't know what to do with it than if I were not to have enough of a crop to provide what I need. So this guy in the story seems kind of on the ball. He's, he's prospering. Um, he's, he's successful in the way that we have been programmed to define success, right? I think we've all seen the bumper sticker or the slogan somewhere. You can't be too rich or too thin, right? And we... Th- we're tempted to believe it. Can't be too rich. You can't be too thin. And as George Bernard Shaw has said, who admittedly was not a Christian, but a pretty creative and and intelligent guy, as George Bernard Shaw has said, it's not the love of money which is the root of all evil. I mean, whoever said that? You know, it's not the love of money which is the root of all evil. It's the lack of money which is the root of all evil. And many people would agree, right? But just as we would set this guy up and establish this guy as maybe an ancient embodiment of the American dream and say, that's our man, he's doing it right, another character walks onto the scene, right? And we discover that this guy's had a partner we we didn't know about all along, a partner who's been ignored. And it turns out the partner who's been with this guy all along is God, is God. The one the Bible tells us has created everything that is. The one who will judge every human heart the ruler of all the universe, steps onto the scene and describes this rich farmer with one word. And he doesn't say that he's evil, right? He doesn't say he's evil. He doesn't say he's a criminal or sociopath or a psychopath, but the word is not very flattering, is it? What is the one word God uses to describe this farmer? What's the word? Fool. He says, you are a fool. Another way of saying that is, buddy, you are inept. When it comes to life, you have not even begun to figure it all out, Alfie. Not even, not even close. Death makes generous givers of all of us. Did you notice what happened with this guy when he got out his schematics, got out his plans to build these huge barns? God comes along and says, this is your last night on earth. So what's going to become of all this stuff that you have. Nothing 
Nothing frees our hold on what we have like the grave. Like Billy Graham used to say, I've never seen a U-Haul trailer behind a hearse. Death makes generous givers of us all. And what we consider so valuable, so, so worthwhile, is going to end up on a folding table in a garage sale that our kids would probably rather not even bother with. God says, God says that death makes generous givers of us all. But there's kind of a discrepancy in this story, right? I mean, on the one hand, we want to say this guy's done it right. He's worked hard, and his crops have produced this abundance, and he's going to hold on to it. You know, get that. And, but then God comes along and, and, and calls this guy a fool. And not only is God calling this guy a fool, but it's Jesus' view of God. And typically, we feel like we can trust Jesus' judgment about life, right? It, so how do we make sense of this dis, sort of discrepancy between the guy's our hero, he's doing it right, and then God's calling him a fool. Well, there's a Bible commentary that makes a little suggestion, and I found this helpful. And in that Bible commentary, it suggests that we imagine interviewing this farmer's widow a week after his funeral. So let's do that. Get in the car. We're going to go see this man's widow one week after his funeral. You ready? We're driving into the driveway, gravel driveway. And the first thing we notice as we get to the house is it's kind of small for such a rich guy. I mean, you know, rich guy, wealthy, little, little house, tiny. And, and the closer we get, we, we notice it's kind of run down. We notice it has not been maintained well at all. But it's surrounded by these huge barns with grain just f spilling out of the top. Go to the door, knock on the door, and say, we'd love to talk to you about your husband. She invites us in, has us sit down. Tears fill her eyes as she, as she says, I'll tell you about my husband. My husband was a good man. My husband was a hard worker. I don't know if anyone worked any harder than my husband. Work consumed him. He was up before sunrise, out in the fields, didn't come home to supper. He worked as hard or harder than anybody I ever know, I've ever known. But he never was able to enjoy the fruit of his labor. And when we saw this, this abundant crop that, that, our, that our fields had produced, so big that even he was astonished by it, I said to him, honey, this is wonderful. This is wonderful. Now maybe finally you can rest a little bit. Maybe, maybe now we can go on those trips we've always wanted to go on, see those places that we've wanted to see. Maybe, maybe we can reconnect with, with family members that we've lost touch with over the years. Or maybe we could build another bedroom onto the house and have, have guests over. Maybe we could use some of the profit from this harvest to help our children. Some of them are kind of struggling, trying to get out of Canada or wherever, <laughs> wherever they may be. Or maybe, maybe it's time to give your workers a bonus. You know, you've always talked about how hard those workers have, have worked for you and you want to give them a bonus. Maybe, maybe now we can do that. Look at this, look at this harvest. But you said, my husband said... I want to do all those things. I really do. And, I, and I'm going to do all those things someday. 
but now I've got to build some barns. And she said, then was always the operative word in my husband's life. I've got to build these barns, and then we'll build a another bedroom, then we'll reconnect with family members, then we'll give my employees a bonus. And she said, then never came. My husband could never seem to see that now, here and now, is the only life that we have. So, we kind of see God's point of view in, in, in this parable. John Claypool, who is a great Baptist preacher turned Episcopal priest and author, and has said that there are three verbs that describe our relationship with what we have. Three verbs. The first verb is to enjoy. We can enjoy, we can enjoy what we have as a gift from God, as a blessing from God. Think about this parable. What had to happen for that farmer to have the harvest that he did? How much of that could he control? The wind blowing the way it did, the sun shining as it did, the rain falling down when it fell, none of it, none of it. It was a blessing, it was a gift, and yet when it came, he couldn't enjoy it. He was too consumed with trying to hold on to what the ground had almost miraculously produced. So. Enjoy, to enjoy is one verb that can describe what we have, but it didn't describe that man's relationship, did it? Another verb is to do. We can do good things with what we have. Let me ask you this. Where is the best place to store extra food in a huge barn where a lot of it would rot, mold, rats would eat it. I mean, that's one option, right? We can take our extra food and cram it in some huge barns where it's not doing anybody any good. So see, this farmer could have gone out to the orphanage, right? and said, you know what? We want to feed these children for three months. And then him and his wife could have gone out to the orphanage and seen the good that this food was doing. Look into the faces of those children being fed. To do, to do. I like that one. One way that we can relate to what we have. But the farmer in this story, he... He didn't enjoy what he had. He didn't see it as, a, as a, a blessing to himself and a way to bring joy to someone else. He didn't do good things with it. His relationship to what he had is described by the verb to have, <laughs> to control, to accumulate, to acquire He didn't enjoy it. He didn't do good things. He just tried to get more and more and more. And God comes along and says, this guy does not know what it's all about. This guy has not figured out how to live life. And that's sad, isn't it? But here's the good news. This is just a story. It's like a cartoon, you know? It's a parable. The guy's not even real. He never even existed. And the good news is we can, we can escape a life of ineptitude. We can experience what 
life is all about, right? I'm not an Alfie. I'm not an Alfie. But someone who is has told us. So, so, a week after our funeral, and we're all going to die, right? We're all going to have that night that the guy in this parable had. And a week after our funeral, the good news is we can live so that the best someone says about us isn't, boy, he was a hard worker, or she was a hard worker. We can experience, embrace life as it's meant to be lived. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, as we think about our response to today's theme, today's message, I want to encourage us to think about those verbs. I want to encourage us to think about how we can enjoy what God has given us as a gift, talents we have, time we have, health, energy, possessions. How can we use what we have to bring joy to ourselves and blessing to others. What good things can we do with what we have? I know this is not stewardship time. We're United Methodists. That comes a little bit later in the fall, but we've already kind of been planning on, on, on that, on that um, emphasis. And I want us to think about our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness and how we can use what God has given us as a way of experiencing joy and blessing others. So I encourage you to think about uh, ways you can experience that, that life as we stand and sing our final song. I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's a word That will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song For song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship It's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, love, for I've made it It's all about you It's all about you Jesus King of endless work no one can express how much you deserve Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours Every single breath, I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the 
the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship It's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made it it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm going back to the heart of worship. It's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made it. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'll bring you more than a song, more than a song. About your grace, God, I'll bring you more than a song, more than a song. About your grace, God, I'll bring you more than a song, more than a song. Happy are those who know real treasure and where to find it. Go now as those who have received God's treasure and share it unselfishly. And may the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you as you go this day and forever. Amen. Blessed be the tie that binds Our hearts in Christian love The fellowship of kindred minds Is like to that Great Sunday. Outro heart of worship. One, two, three.